HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman, hosted by Carl Franklin. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 173, recorded live Thursday, July 23rd, 2009. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Mary Jo Foley about Windows 7 and the future of Microsoft. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Um, I'm here today talking with Mary Jo Foley. Mary Jo runs the All About Microsoft blog for ZDNet. She has an unblinking eye on Microsoft, and you've been uh, doing journalism around Microsoft for a very long time, haven't you, Mary Jo? I have, Scott. Way too long. <laughs> uh, are, you, are you sick at, uh, of looking at just one company? No. I, you guys are always a fascinating company because every time you think you've figured out Microsoft and you've got it all figured out and you know what they're going to do, they do something surprising. Yeah, that so, Project Natal sure surprised me. I didn't see that coming at all. <laughs> yeah, really? Wow. It's, it's good they can still surprise people who work there. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's funny. I mean, there were, we're 80,000 people, and uh, you know, something like Natal comes out, or it come, you know, they go on Jimmy Fallon. Uh, I always get a cousin or someone calling and saying, oh, my goodness, why didn't you tell me? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> they don't tell us anything. I mean... <laughs> Uh, I work for the developer division, so uh, you know I think about developer tools. I, I, I think that you know Windows Seven coming out was just as exciting and wonderful as anybody else did. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I was thinking it was very exciting myself. So it was funny. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and I said, you know, even though I don't work on the Windows team, never have worked for Microsoft. Whenever a new version of Windows comes out, I still feel kind of like. I'm part of it in a way because I have to write about every little twist and turn of Windows. I mean, I've been writing about Windows 7 for three years. So mm-hmm. it's like, wow, they did it. On to the next thing, you know? Yeah, I feel like you should get your little ship it um, uh, badge or your, your your piece of clear plastic that you put on your on your fireplace <laughs> mantle. <it says. laughs> My non-blue badge. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's interesting. I've worked at Microsoft now. It'll be two years in September. September, October, somewhere in there. And while I was in no way involved in shipping Windows 7, I did uh, file some bugs. And I learned some really interesting things about how, how bugs work, is that if it's a non-interesting, you know, interesting, and I put that in quotes, non-interesting bug, like one that's not a huge deal, uh, then you really have to kind of be the, the advocate for that bug. Mm. So I think I filed maybe... I don't know, 10 or 15 bugs, and I, I got six or seven fixed. And these are all kind of mostly aesthetic things like, uh, you know, this icon is, is ambiguous, or, you know, when you do this really obscure thing to the start menu on a Tuesday, then this happens. But when it, when those bugs closed, and you can like search in the bug database for Scott HA, and you go, you know, what did Scott HA file? I feel like, hey, yeah, you know, I made this a better product. So I feel like, if I ever hear that someone did that weird thing to the start menu on a Tuesday and it worked, then I had a tiny, tiny role in that. And that was a, a sense of pride I didn't think that I would get because I'm trying not to be assimilated by the the big blue monster. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I have done nothing like that. Um, I mean, I, I get to play with some of the um, test builds of Windows 7, like I got the beta and the RC. And, but, you know, I'm not a techie. Even though I write about operating systems, I kind of write from a layperson's point of view. So um, I still I still was interested in seeing how the whole process works and how, how that all happens and how bugs get fixed or don't. It's interesting. Yeah, the, the, the triage process is really interesting. Uh, they, they put a lot of thought into what the end user experience is going to be. I found some really obscure bug when a certain printer was installed, when you, you know, when a certain printer was plugged in, when you booted up, uh, you know, the, then your boot up would be slower. Uh, and it was some obscure firmware driver, and they had to think about, well, how many of these printers are out there, and what'll happen? It's really interesting to me because with with like Apple products, you've got uh, a lot less hardware diversity, but with yep. Windows, man, you don't know what anybody's running. You know, who knows what <laughs> random sure. <laughs> TV, you know, European TV card that they have plugged into some random mouse, and it all has to work together. 
Yeah. I mean, you know, that's a, it's always kind of funny to me when people just say, well, Apple's products work so much better together, and, like, why can't Microsoft do that? I'm like, well, if Microsoft owned the NM process, they could, too. Um, but that's not how it works, and there's all these different parts that come from different places, the software, hardware, drivers, this, that. I mean, there's a lot of things to mix and match and see if they all work. Mm-hmm. Now, you uh, you just said something interesting. You said that you've been writing about this from the point of view of a lay person. So, I mean, you're not a programmer. You're not uh, – but you know, are you, would you think of yourself as a power user? Or would you think of yourself as kind of an average Joe user or Jolene user? Oh, I, I think of myself as a completely average user. And, and mm-hmm. other people who've tried to help me fix things would agree, I'm sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's funny. I know I know about – um, technology. Uh, I'm a journalist by training, and I've never taken a computer science class. And um, you know, everything I've learned about operating systems, I've learned by writing and reporting about them. So, you know, just because I happen to do that job doesn't necessarily mean when people send me something, I go, "Okay, run such and such a script or do this." I'll be like, "Okay, I don't know how to do that. Sorry, you guys got to help me here." And um, mm-hmm. so I'm no in no way a power user. So you so you're experiencing it as you go like were you running uh betas of Windows 7 did you experience it and as a user and say wow this feels different or darn those drivers don't work were you having this happen as it as it happened Um well you know I I run as my day-to-day um work machine Windows XP on a ThinkPad and that's what I've been running for the past 3 years and I still run that now um, the way I experienced Windows 7 was on a loaner machine, a loaner ThinkPad, um, where I had the different beta and RC builds installed there. Um, so I get to kind of go back and forth between the two and try it out and see what was different. And um, I have to admit, when I got my first build of Windows 7, I was like, yikes, I don't know how to do this, because I haven't been using Vista. And mm-hmm. so it looked really different to me, because I'm still using the old XP look and feel and um, it felt like a big jump, but after I used it a few times, I'm like, no, it's way more intuitive than I thought it was, and it's not going to be a you know a switch that people can't make. I mean, I mean, I feel like if I can do it, so can they. Yeah, it's funny. I was talking to our producer Lawrence uh, before the show while we were waiting for you to call in, and he said, "Yeah, I hear the Windows Seven is out. What is it like? Is it got a lot of eye candy?" And I was like, "Well, that's a really that's a really loaded question. Eye candy. I mean, is it prettier? <laughs> sure." Is it prettier for no reason? No, I don't think that's the case. No, I, I would say actually what I liked about Windows 7 was it doesn't have a lot of eye candy, and it's kind of a stripped-down, clean-looking interface. And that appeals to me because I've I've actually tried to use the Mac operating system a number of times, and I'm always ridiculed by Mac users for not wanting to switch over to it because supposedly it's so much more intuitive and more fun to use and a better interface. But I feel like as a, someone who's used Windows all the time I've used a computer, it's not that intuitive to switch from Windows to Mac. Mac to me is more eye candy. Interesting. I know that I, I like the Mac uh, animations. You know, there's all, they're all, the windows are always running away like genies and stuff, <laughs> which I think is cool. Yeah. But... Uh, and you know, we have two Macs at the house here. I've got a Mac, which is kind of like the kitchen recipe machine. It's a Mac Mini, and then we've got a Mac Pro. But, you know, I people will say I'm a Microsoft shill, but I just keep booting Windows 7 on the thing. I just say, well, you know, forget about it. I'll just boot Windows 7 because it's a, it's a fine little Windows 7 laptop. Yep, yep. You know, one of the interesting things about Windows 7 that, that, that surprised me was that I'm running it here and looking at I'm sitting in front of, uh, four monitors on a quad processor machine with, uh, I think I've got either 8 or 12 gigs of RAM. I've actually got so much RAM I've forgotten how much RAM I have. Mm. And next to me over here, I've got a tiny Dell Mini with a gig of RAM and a little tiny 16 gig hard drive. And it's the same operating system. It's working really well. Yep. Have, you, have you run it on big machines and small machines? Um, I haven't. I've only tried it on the ThinkPad, but you know, when, when it comes out in October, I, I'm really, really interested in buying a copy of Windows 7 preloaded on a netbook. And the reason I am is because I'm, I'm probably like, um, one of the stereotypical types who would make a lot of use out of a netbook. You know, I have, I have a regular machine at home that's my laptop, everyday machine, mm-hmm. but I want a machine I can just grab, throw in my purse, and go cover a press conference. And, my laptop right now is a little big and a little heavy to do that. 
Um, so I'm like, wow, wouldn't that be cool to have a really good operating system on a netbook and just mm-hmm. be able to take it and go and, and then come back home and use my regular desktop? So a little mix and match thing going on there. Yeah, this this talk of the uh, the Intel guys, the the bosses at Intel, the 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 suits, the, the executives saying that netbooks really aren't that useful seems silly to me. The uh, I love my my netbook. Uh, if it could get even a little bit smaller, with I wish it could have a fold out keyboard. Even I mean, yeah. I, I was one of those guys who used to sit on an airplane with a Palm Pilot and a fold out keyboard. Remember those little keyboards that yep. were like the size of a wallet, yep. and then you'd go. And it would suddenly be a full size <laughs> keyboard. You know, I'd sit there staring at this little black and white screen trying to write like the great American novel just because, <laughs> just because of the satisfaction I would get carrying an entire portable word processing system in my back pocket. Yeah, I, I always feel like that too. It's funny because a lot of people say, Oh, you don't really want a netbook. You want a full fledged laptop. And I think there's kind of this, um, disjointed understanding about who really does want a netbook. Like people are like, oh, it's only low power users and they get really frustrated with the keyboard. They get really frustrated with not enough memory. But Mm -hmm. for somebody like me, like a quote information worker, as I'm called in the, in the way Microsoft categorizes people, I, a lot of days I don't open a lot of apps. I might open like say word and an email uh, client and a browser and that's it for the whole day. Like I don't use anything else. And so a netbook would be perfect for that. Yeah, um, I run. I'm looking at my taskbar here. I've got TweetDeck, I've got a browser, uh, chat window, Zoom, and Outlook. So yep. I don't know. What is that? Six applications. Yep. For some reason, the day of having twenty, forty different applications running at the same time, unless I'm actively developing, I don't find myself running a, a, a thousand applications. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, if if all you do is kind of what I do, which is create and consume information, you don't really need a lot of other apps. Like, people are like, what about Photoshop? I'm like, I've never used Photoshop in my life, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, it's funny. I actually use, uh, I use Paint. I use a, a program called Paint.net, uh, which is a little free application. It's almost like what you used to need is built in now. So, uh, you know, I used Photoshop back in the day, and then now I don't have to buy Photoshop because I'm not a professional designer. I'll use Paint.net, which is free. And then, you know, more and more, I'll just use the paintbrush that's built into uh, into Windows 7 because it's got it'll save as PNG now, and it'll do it'll do the stuff that I need. So the the expectation of what comes out of the box is is greater. Yeah. Like I noticed that Windows 7, my DVD. Remember the whole thing with Vista? I think you probably covered this when DVDs wouldn't play out of the box. You had to go and get a codec or download something to make your your DVDs play. Yep, yep, I remember um, that. Now, just uh, even 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 really complicated codecs on Windows 7 work out of the box. I didn't have to download any fancy um, a codec, of course, for those folks that don't necessarily are native English speakers or. Or uh, I think it's compressor decompressor, and these are the files that allow you to w- watch various videos. And uh, Windows Vista didn't have some codecs, I think, early on. And uh, I-, I seem to remember, maybe it was XP, that you had to download a DVD driver to get things working. Mm-hmm. But uh, I'm realizing that uh, I may want to go and pave my machine, you know, start from scratch with Windows 7, even though I'm running the release candidate. Back in the day, I used to have to install... 50 to 100 different applications to get a machine back. I'm looking through my start menu here, and I could probably get a machine up and running in about four hours, and it would have taken me several days. Mm-hmm. Now, why don't you run Vista? You said you're running XP on your primary machine. Yeah, you know, I I run a really uh, kind of low-end ThinkPad. I've only got a gig of RAM in this mm-hmm. ThinkPad, um, and I never have upgraded it. Um, back to the, am I a power user? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, so everybody's like, add more memory. And I'm like, yeah, I don't really think I know how. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, brother, you know, come on. Um, but yeah, I, so I've never really tinkered with it. And, you know, because I'm a one person shop, I'm self employed, I'm a freelancer who's self employed, and um, I don't have an IT department. So I'm always afraid if I really screw up my machine, I'm really out of luck because I don't have anybody who can go, okay, let me go back and, you know, check your archives and do this and that and, oh, you did this or that to it and that's why it's not working. I don't have somebody I can call on like that other than, you know, my friends oh. who are in the tech community and a few of them have said they'd make a house call, but, 
it's still, you know, kind of kind of scary to somebody who's like an average user like me to be tinkering with all this stuff and moving to an operating system that I know has higher requirements than mm-hmm. possibly would be good on this PC. So I've I've just never done it. And what kind of a ThinkPad is it? What's the the brand, the, the model number? X60. An X60. Oh yeah. You'll have no trouble with that on Windows 7. Yeah. You yeah, I think RAM, I, I, I'm not afraid to try it with Windows 7, but I was more afraid to try it with Vista Plus. Oh, I see. Yeah, well, that, that's that's a very good reason. Yeah. Also, you know, with with um, with uh, Vista, I also I got to say when I also got a chance to test that out as it was being developed, and I never liked a lot of things about it. You know, the hibernation lags and the kind of mm-hmm. um, all the UAC prompts, which they've scaled back quite a bit in Vista. I mean, in mm-hmm. Windows 7. So I, I kind of felt like I'm not really missing anything by not running Vista. I've got a fully patched XP machine, and I'm just going to stick with that until Windows 7 comes. Right, right, right. Yeah, my, my, I'm trying to get my wife. Uh, I got in trouble early on in the Windows 7 cycle because I upgraded her machine to Windows 7 beta without asking. Oops. So <laughs> I am no longer allowed to touch my wife's computer. <laughs> You're banned. <laughs> yes, but, but yesterday, when, you know, the release candidate came out, you know, not the release candidate, we RTM'd, rather, released to manufacturing yesterday. So I'm like, I'm so excited. I get to in- introduce Windows 7 to my wife, and now there's a family pack, and I want to go get the family pack. And, mm-hmm. uh, I, you know, you, you know what you're getting for, uh, for Christmas from me, I'm afraid, is a copy of Windows 7. <laughs> well, that's not a bad gift, I don't think. I don't think so. Do you think now as a you've done a lot of analysis and you've been watching all of this, I mean is this uh is this a winner for us? Is this going to turn things around for Microsoft? That's a, that's a big goal there, but um it's definitely a winner. I think it's really great. Um I have to go with the analysts who say it's what Vista should have been. Um mm-hmm. it really it's very solid and it feels like yeah, this is something you'd want to try and not not be afraid to you know, implement in multiple tens of thousands of seats across your company. Um, you know, there's a lot of other things Microsoft has going on besides that, which make me scared to say it's going to turn all of Microsoft around. But I think it, I think it's really solid, and mm-hmm. um, I think it's it was admirable that Microsoft did what they said they do. They got it in, uh, you know, into RTM within the window. They said partners seem to really like it. I talked to Dell and some other OEMs, Toshiba, and they really think it's pretty solid and are committed mm-hmm. to it. So those are all good signs. That's good. That's good. Because you get a pretty wide, uh, like you said, you work for yourself, so you're completely objective in this sense. So you, you contract to ZDNet. Is that how, I, how that works? Yeah. I So I blog um, for ZDNet, and it's public information that the way we get paid by ZDNet is we get paid by our traffic. So every oh, time really? you click on my blog, you are giving me a penny. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, I didn't realize. That's actually a pretty good system because it's always good to know who your journalists work for, to yep. know if there's any special interests or whatever. That uh, So you don't care. I mean, I, I suppose you would care if Microsoft went away because then you'd have to find another company to, to focus on. But yes, you're not uh, invested in Microsoft one way or the other. You're just reporting on what's going on at Microsoft. Right. We we even have a pretty strict disclosure policy on um, ZDNet where we have to say if we have any kind of stake in the company. So I own no Microsoft stock, so there's no reason I'm doing oh, wow. insider trading or trying to make the stock go up or down. And we have to be pretty clear about, you know, do we take gifts? Do we give them back? We're, we, we're very strict about all those kind of things so that people don't think we're on the take. Oh, that's cool. I, I, I didn't realize that. That's uh, yep. That's interesting. Okay. So you said you've been talking to the different Dell and the different uh, OEMs, and it's looking like we're going to have machines in the stores that are going to have Windows 7 on them pretty uh, pretty soon, before October, uh, middle of October. Yeah, October 22nd is considered the day when retailers and the PC makers can start actually selling machines with Windows 7 preloaded. But people can get the bits before that. If, you, if Say if you're like an MSDN or a TechNet subscriber, you'll be able to get them in August. Um, and volume licensees can get them around September 1st. So, you know, people will start actually being able to get them before that big launch date. Okay. I, I, you know, I have to say as a, as a, not just as an employee, because I've only been there two years, but as a person who's, you know, gone through the whole 95, 98, Windows Me, 2000, the whole process, I thought it was pretty awesome that we put it out on time. Yeah. Yep. That, that was good. That was very good. <laughs> I'm watching people you know, on Twitter. They're like, stuff. they're like, think it's um, a joke. Yeah. I thought, a bunch of people thought it was, it was a joke that we actually finished it on time. <laughs> Technically, 
basically, it's early, as I'm sure people will point out. Um, oh, is it? You know, for a long time, Microsoft was saying, we're going to get it out by the first part of 2010. And a lot of us who covered the company were like, yeah, you're just giving yourself, you know, the maximum window, so you know you're going to be on time, if not early. But, you mm-hmm. know, to get it out now and RTM this summer, it's it's good. It's They did it. So that's good. Hey, everybody. This is Scott coming at you from another place in time. No doubt you probably bump into testing tasks now and then in your work. And you know writing functional tests is probably not your favorite thing. It's kind of difficult, takes time, and the results can be dubious. Well, get ready to start liking tests uh, thanks to Telerik with the uh, the new WebEye testing framework. Building web automation tests is a breeze. You've got code automation with advanced ASP.NET AJAX and Serverlight applications. You can write a single test, have it executed against multiple browsers at once, you benefit from a rich API. There's link support, integration with Visual Studio unit testing, also NUnit, XUnit, and MBUnit, not to mention the free wrappers for Telerik RAD controls for ASP.NET AJAX and Serverlight, all shipping with Telerik's new testing tool. One of the best features, the WebEye testing framework, which is developed by Art of Test, is it's absolutely free. If you've already got hooked on WebEye testing framework, start using it right away. Go to Telerik.com for more info. Thanks a lot. So if you, uh, I want to get back onto one other thing, because uh, you, the, the idea of you as a, as a user, as a user of Windows and as a, as a journalist watching Windows is interesting to me. You are, uh, independent. You have an XP machine. You have a Windows 7 machine off to the side. You have no IT department to keep you, uh, in line if you install some driver. So if your machine's down, then you're in trouble. Yeah. Do, do you, I'm in bad do you trouble. use Windows Home Server? Cause I know you blog about Home Server also. <laughs> Here's another funny thing about my weird existence. So I live in New York City, Mm -hmm. and um, I live in Manhattan. I have a very small apartment because Mm -hmm. everyone in New York does, unless you're very wealthy. And um, (laughs) the home server guys at one point were like, you want to get a home server and hook up all your, you know, different PCs and have them all back up to the home server? I'm like, I have nowhere to put a home server, literally. (laughs) (laughs) Because your apartment is too (laughs) small. I could, I all my closet space is full. I mean, I have two closets in my whole apartment, and they're full. You and, realize um, you're giving our listeners quite the visualization. They're trying to figure out this <laughs> this place is filled with research so, yeah, to the gill. You've got you know no bookshelves. For a home go- server. <laughs> have you seen a home server? I'm looking at a home server. It's the size of a dictionary. Surely you can fit a dictionary in your apartment. I. The other day was shopping for a blender, and I didn't buy it because I don't have a place to put it. Wow. <laughs> you need to. It's a shame you can't invest in Microsoft so, stock. Space is at an ultra premium here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's because you don't invest in Microsoft stock. Yes. <laughs> then you would. Be, then you would be rich. Yeah, I tell you, the Windows Home Server, man, that was the operating system until Windows Seven. That was the operating system that was that had me so stoked. I actually, funny Windows Home uh, Home Server story. Uh, when we moved into this house here in Oregon, I needed to get the yard done. And uh, I was, we hired the guy to come and put in the lawn and to do some, some landscaping. And I'm, I'm, I'm a real ch- notoriously cheap individual. And I noticed that the guy had this laptop. And you know, you know, you know these guys when you've got, well, you probably don't because you don't have a lawn. When you have a guy come and do your yard, they, they might have a, a pickup truck and then a laptop. And the laptop is probably from the late seventies at some point. And it's yeah. been thrown into the, uh, you know, he just picks it up and he throws it onto the, the bench seats in his, in his, in his pickup truck. And this thing was just beat to hell. I hadn't seen a laptop as well loved as this thing. And I said, wow, you do your entire business on that laptop? And he's like, oh yeah, man, that, that thing died. That is the only, that's my entire business right there. And, you know, and I'm thinking to myself, let me see, mean time before failure of a hard drive is five years. And this guy's had this thing for seven. He's literally on borrowed time, you know. Murphy's law would indicate that next, the next day, my lawn guy is going to have his business collapse because of his little laptop. So I said, I'll trade you a Windows home server if you give me $1,000 off of my lawn. Wow. So I went out and to Best Buy and bought a Windows home server. I think it was like 500 bucks, And I took it over to his house and I set it up for him. Wow. And got his laptop backing up and uh, his wife's machine, his kid's machine. Whole operation was like about I don't know, three hours, four hours. And, uh, and then about four months later, uh, he had a crash and he had the stuff that he needed off of his home server. Hmm. So well, yeah, I cannot, the home, whether you use Windows home server or something, you know, God, back up your stuff, please, yeah. people. You know, the other reason I never, um, took their offer of trying out the home server was 
I'm re- you realistically, I have one PC. I mean, I have all these loaner machines that I'm always giving back and trading in and getting a different loaner. But I, I mean, if what would I, what would I really back up to home server except for my one machine? Well, so so let me let me give you an example. Um, I have effectively, well, I have seven machines, but I have one machine effectively. I have, you know, my primary machine. Mm-hmm. And it had a 160 gig hard drive. And I recently got an SSD, right? Mm-hmm. A solid state disk that was a 250 gig. So how do I play with my new SSD while still continuing to work? Well, my, my home server backs up an image of the entire PC, the entire PC's hard drive every single night at two in the morning. It wakes up the laptop, backs it up, and then goes to sleep. So all I had to do was remove the old hard drive, which is sitting right here next to me, put the SSD in, boot off of a CD. It automatically connected to the Windows home server and said, oh, this is your ThinkPad. Do you want me to restore? I click restore. Even though I backed up a 160 and I restored it to a 250, I was up and running about four hours later, and I'd restored my machine completely, booted off of it, and now I'm, I'm, I'm on the same machine with double the size of a hard drive, and it's an SSD, so it's twice as fast. What I'm saying to you is that let's say your single machine crashes tomorrow. How fast can you get back up? <laughs> with, with a no, home I- server, you just buy a hard drive, and you restore from last night's backup, and you keep working. Yep. Hmm. I'm saying you take a blender out of the kitchen and make the room. <laughs> my dictionary out and trade it for a home yes, server. Yes, you don't need a thesaurus anymore, Mary Jo. Just, no, I do not. And there must I be a book, one. something large. <laughs> I actually I actually recently, speaking of gadgets and devices, bought a Kindle. Oh, you, oh because fantastic. I was running out of room to get any more books, and I love to read. So mm-hmm. I, I was like, wow, i gotta, I got to solve this problem because I have no more space for any more books. So I got a Kindle, and man, it's awesome. I love it. Do you have the Kindle 2 or the Kindle DX? Yep, I get the Kindle 2. Okay. Now, I, I I actually love my Kindle. I've talked about this on my blog a number of times, that the Kindle is a joy. Although I'm going to yeah. try to borrow a Kindle DX from somebody in town because I want to see what the larger one is like. Mm-hmm. Now, I get the New York Times on my on my Kindle. Have you set that up too? No, I, I just read the Times on the web. So. Oh, yeah, well, that's the same thing. The, uh, the, the, how many books do you have in your Kindle? And have you done the audio books? You know, I, I really have never gotten into audio books. Um, I really still like to read visually. So I got my Kindle in, um, I think it was around April or so, and mm-hmm. um, I've read about 10 books on it so far um, because I've noticed I can read way faster on the Kindle than I can paper. And it's just so handy because I travel a lot to be able to just take everything with you in, in this little tiny device. I get stopped everywhere I go in New York. People are like, is that a Kindle? Wow, cool. Can I hold it? I feel like I should get a commission on selling them. <laughs> you just said you read faster on a Kindle than a regular book. How is that possible? I, I've noticed I am finishing books way faster. Um, I think it's because I just keep a finger on the uh, next page button, and I just my eyes just kind of go zing, 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 and next page, next page, next really? page. Next, next thing I know, I'm done with the book. So I don't know why. That is, is interesting. I wonder if, if people are actually saving time. You know, crucial seconds that they didn't, uh, that they were, they were wasting pay, turning pages. Yeah, I, before. it's, I never thought it would really make that much of a difference. I'm like, oh, what's the difference between turning a page versus hitting a button? But mm-hmm. I, you know, the, the type changes so quickly and it's, I think it's very easy on the eyes. I've been surprised how that's been too. So I've, I'm reading a lot and, um, reading faster. Yeah, I, uh, I use my Kindle. I think that I'm reading faster or reading more. I don't know about reading faster, but I definitely know I'm reading more. Uh, I, I, I have the thing with me all the time. I, I, yeah. I read more magazines. And the thing that I feel really the worst about is, uh, kind of exactly the, the idea that this is a direct link from Jeff Bezos into my wallet. So yeah. it makes it so easy to give him money. <laughs> we might as well just deduct it from my paycheck, but I feel bad <laughs> because I'll be at the airport. I'll go to a bookstore that's owned by some poor, you know, businessman. I'll flip through the physical book and then I'll buy it on the Kindle while I'm standing yeah. there. So Jeff Bezos is actually stealing money from this man while I stand in his bookstore. Yeah, I know. It's it's kind of like the same thing with music, you know, like how you how you used to be able to go to Virgin Records, which are all closed up in New York now, and you could like listen to a CD or listen to new music and then like go home and buy the digital version, you know. <laughs> it's like, oh, I'm kind of stealing in a way because I'm using them to preview if I want something or not. It is sad. 
Now, this is a, a, a jagged segue, but I wanted to make sure we talked about this before uh, before I let you go. The Chrome Chrome OS, what do you think about this? Well, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about it. Number one, we don't know much about it, so it's kind of hard to, quote, think about it. Um, mm-hmm. We don't really know what it's going to look like. How much is it really an operating system versus a browser? How much is it Linux versus not? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I was reading a really interesting speculative piece by Michael Miller, you know, who used to be the editor-in-chief of PC Mag, mm-hmm. about it. And he pointed out that, you know, um, Google never said this was a PC operating system. And, uh, you know, everyone's saying it, it's going to compete with Windows and it's going to be another, you know, thorn in Microsoft's side. But what if he's right and it's not really a PC OS and it's just like a dedicated netbook OS, that's all it is. You know, it's, so is it really meant to go head-to-head with Windows or is it just kind of a, gl- a glitzier, souped-up browser? I, th- mm. I think it's an interesting question, and I'm really curious to see what it looks like. That is an interesting question. I think that there's kind of two sub-questions there. One is support for drivers, right? I mean, are they going to take Ubuntu mm-hmm. and then strip it down and put Chrome browser on it? And then that that would be a general-purpose PCOS, but maybe yep. they would block it so you couldn't install anything which is yeah. a, basically an appliance OS. And then the, the, the second question is, well, what about Ubuntu? I think that Ubuntu as a, as, a, as a Linux desktop has such a following and people uh, who are into Linux enjoy it so much that they might find that it was, it was presumptuous of Google to go and think that they could make their own. Hmm. You know, to, to announce the Chrome OS might offend Linux users who already like their chosen um, their chosen operating system. But, but I think the really interesting question is, are they presuming a fundamental shift in, in, in the way that software is run? Like, uh, who was it who said recently that they thought that the app store was a bad idea? Yeah, a few people have been saying that recently. Yeah, they're saying like the death of the app store, like the app store is a blip. The app store we're talking about is the iPhone app store. The yeah. idea that you would, Go to an, a store online, purchase software for a specific machine, and bring it down. Uh, it's, it feels like Google and the folks that are betting on HTML5 are saying that this is a transitional period that we're in and that all software will be written in HTML5. All purchase software will be, uh, you know, uh, something that you, you'd buy a subscription to or you'd buy access to, but you'll end up running it in some kind of a browser. It was the Palm guys. That's who it was. It was the CEO of Palm. And their operating system on the Palm Pre is, is basically the entire OS is like a web browser. Yep. I don't know. I, 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 I think I, I understand the point of view that really my netbook is a portable browser. Mm-hmm. But just when I think that, I need to run Excel. Or, you know, just when I think that, I run Visual Studio. So. Right. Exactly. Or you want to hook it up to a printer. Exactly. Like, that's, that's the other thing. We don't know. Can, can it print? Can it work with any existing peripherals? Like, that, that kind of means it's not, to me, if it can't, is it an operating system, quote unquote, at all? Yep. Yep. I have no idea. Yeah. I, I'm going to be really curious to see what it looks like. <laughs> Now, when I chatted you earlier, you were asking about uh, uh, a thing called Gestalt. Yes, I'm. I'm curious about Gestalt. I, I read about it on the Mix Online um, site, and I was chatting with Jeff Sanquist a little bit about it. And I, I'm trying to think of a way to explain it to a layperson because mm. it's supposedly meant to make um, developing easier. So I should right. be able to explain it to a non-programmer, right? Uh, okay, that's a good question. So can you okay, help so, me, Scott? <laughs> yes, I can. So in the old days, we wrote HTML, and an HTML was a declaration of what things should look like. And you'd say, here's a table, here's a picture. Isn't that nice? And that was HTML, and it was good. Yep. Um, then JavaScript, which was originally called LiveScript and has nothing to do with Java, came along. And this let us take the description of what something should look like and add uh, a description of behavior. I could write a tiny program in a tiny language, and it was also good. Uh, And then JavaScript grew up and became a full-fledged, powerful, object-oriented engine, and then the the JavaScript wars began, and everyone wants faster and stronger and more wonderful. But all the while, there's a group of people who just don't like this language. They just don't find it to be the language that makes them happy. Everyone is speaking Spanish and they want to speak Italian. They just don't (laughs) like it. So what, what Gestalt is, is the opportunity to 
plug in different languages that make you as a developer happy. So from the point of view of the the, the lay person, nothing changes. Web, web, web pages are fun and they look great. From the point of view of the developer, sudden, suddenly someone has said, it's okay to speak Italian. Don't worry. We'll speak English. You speak Spanish. We'll speak Italian. Uh, you can use Ruby. You can use Python. And you can talk to your web pages uh, and as well as JavaScript. Hmm. It's it's just a choice. Uh, mm-hmm. And the way it's done is with Silverlight, which is a plug-in like Flash. Flash speaks one language, but Silverlight is uh, a general system that can speak any language. So it's conceivable that other people could extend Gestalt and make other languages available, all of which just make developers uh, happier. So is Silverlight inside of Gestalt, or how does that work? Ah, okay. So Silverlight is a general runtime. It's a general engine that knows how to talk, uh, it knows how to speak .NET. Mm-hmm. And while well, JavaScript engines know how to speak JavaScript, like for yeah. example, Google Chrome and Firefox and IE all speak JavaScript. Like with IE, I can point, I can show you the file on your disk that says that's JavaScript. It's called jscript.dll. I could point to it and say JavaScript lives there. Silverlight isn't a language. It's a it's an environment. It's a runtime. It's a place for a language to run in. But it's yeah. not specific to any language. What Gestalt is doing is it's taking the language out of your HTML page, handing it to Silverlight and saying, hey, run this. Hmm. And because we have things like Iron Ruby and Iron Python, now we can run Python and Ruby from the from the browser. So we're in, in this case, you wouldn't even need to see that Silverlight existed. You could make a tiny one pixel by one pixel sized or invisible even uh, Silverlight instance. You know, you think of Flash and you think of showing up, showing up at a web page and having Flash take over the screen. Yeah. With, with, with something like this, it's a little bit more um, subtle. The, the Silverlight may not even show itself. It may be invisible. Mm-hmm. But the developer is going to utilize that engine and say, oh, you've got Silverlight? Great. I want to speak Ruby, and I'm going to hand it to you. Yeah. As I understand it from Jeff Sanquist's team, it's just it's a, it's a lab. It's a, it's a thing that they've invented as, a, uh, as, a, as an experiment to see if it's possible. Yeah. It's one of those things that everyone, has, everyone who's a programmer has thought about, but no one actually had the chutzpah to do it. And Jeff's team just decided, you know, people need to do this, so let's just try it and see what happens. Mm. It's really yeah. a, an interesting idea. Yeah, it really is. I, I didn't realize the Silverlight connection, and that's that's kind of cool, too. Yeah, so Silverlight is a generalized engine. So, right. th- So, like, an example would be, you know, let's say you're a, a Ruby programmer and you're writing uh, Ruby code, but you really wish you could write Ruby code in the browser. Mm-hmm. Then you could you could do that, too. Yeah. Do you know anything about why they're co- why the code name Gestalt? I don't know. I haven't asked them. I'd have to ask yeah. Jeff Sanquist on on Twitter. But uh, isn't the, the, the Gestalt of something is the gist? It's the yeah. general yeah. the general structure of something to to get your point across. Yep. So I would think that <laughs> they're making a point. Well, I think I, no. I would say that I think they are getting their point across. They're using a different ah. language to do it. They could yeah. have called the thing Project Get Your Point yeah. Across. But that would use English, which is a language we're already using. So why not say it in German and say Project Gestalt? True. They got their point across of the different language, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is exactly what Gestalt does. Yep. Very interesting. I have a question yeah. for you. Can I throw one out Uh-oh. to you? Okay. The interview is over. Yes. <laughs> no, this is an easy one. Because um, I've been asking a lot of people this who are, are using Windows 7, and um, mm-hmm. the responses have been very mixed. Um, what do you think of touch in Windows 7? Like, are you a big touch fan, touch on a laptop and touch on a PC? I mean, I understand why people like touch on a phone yeah. and why some might even want it on a Kindle, but what about on a laptop? Um, I, I was one of the tablet people early on, ah, and okay. uh, so you know, I, I definitely get that. The problem yeah. is that, you know, my phone is greasy. It just, yeah. It's just disgusting. Um, and I sure don't want anyone touching my screen. Um, I'm less interested in touch in the physicality of it and more interested in the gesture aspect of things. It's not yeah. the fact that I actually have to physically touch my screen to move that window. It's mm-hmm. the fact that maybe 
in a couple of years, I won't have to touch the screen at all. I'm looking at three or four monitors in front of me here. Here's my browser at my right hand. I would like to just gesture, flipping my hand to the left, and I want that browser to to kind of move over to the middle window, the middle monitor. That's the promise of touch for me is not having to touch anymore. Hmm. Interesting. So I don't think it's about touch. I think it's about gestures. Yeah, that's cool. Because um, I'm not a big touch advocate. I never really liked the tablet. I just couldn't get used to that as much as I – I actually still take my notes by hand on paper because um, mm-hmm. I can write faster than I can type even. Um, but I, I, I'm i always kind of puzzled over the touch thing because I'm like, wow, who wants to go and, like, be touching their laptop? I just don't see why you would want to do that when you've got the mouse. you get you know, a lot of other ways. I mean, people say it's not meant to – replace the mouse, but still, it feels weird to me. Like, I, I don't want to go touch my laptop. Yeah, I think you have the right the right perspective. If you touch your laptop in the sense that if you're pretending that your finger is a mouse, your finger, mm-hmm. like the finger as pointing device, I think is a mistake. Yeah. Uh, you're not going to be able to click the minimize button with the tip of your finger faster than you can with a mouse. But if if you could just make a gesture and just flip downward with your finger, I could see myself sitting on a plane with a with a machine uh, having, you know, one hand on the mouse, one hand on the keyboard, and maybe lift my hand up and just swipe downward to yep. close a window or to minimize a window. Yeah, so it would be very handy in a small space like my apartment where my keyboard is kind <laughs> of like mashed in on my little desk. Do you have any elbow room at all? Are you able to lift your arms in your apartment? <laughs> you know, I used to live in Seattle, and I had a, I had a, I rented a four-bedroom house when I lived in Seattle, and now I live in one room, literally. Wow. literally. <laughs> Some people say this is progress. Some do not. We need to have you rescued. We're, we're going to send someone to your house, and we're going to have you uh, lowered from the window because uh, this is really concerning. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Mary Jo Foley, for talking to me today. And you can read uh, Mary Jo's stuff up at All About Microsoft at blogs.zdnet.com slash Microsoft. And you're on uh, Twitter now, too, right? As, uh, yes, I, think I am. Mary, Mary Jo Foley, Foley on Twitter. All right. Well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Scott. That was fun. Thanks for having me on. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'll see you again next week. 